In this series of conversations, we've been given an intimate glimpse of the communication problems of the world's leaders when they don't share a common language. The role of the interpreter in our century has become ever more crucial, though that's only imperfectly understood outside those tiny groups at the summit. Pavel Palashenko was always one of the most unobtrusive figures, even when he was pictured standing at the shoulders of President Gorbachev and President Reagan. Last Sunday night, viewers of the Clive Anderson show saw him slip quietly onto the set while the ex-president acknowledged the applause. He's been beside him now ever since Gorbachev blew into the Kremlin like a blast of fresh air. My impression was that this is a kind of surprisingly noble person a surprisingly reasonable individual. Certainly the previous Soviet leaders were quite different. I, I never actually worked with any of them, but we had a certain impression about the kind of person that the Soviet leader was supposed to be. They were quite old, they looked rather dogmatic, and uh, they looked uh, like people on a kind of pedestal. Uh, Gorbachev never looked like that, and that was my first impression which I still think was correct. What was your first big experience in interpreting? Oh, I don't know what you call a big experience. I started working for the UN in 1974 in the interpretation service of the United Nations Secretariat. Worked there for five years, so that was probably what you would call the, the big experience. And, and certainly a, a major learning experience for me. I, I would say that professionally I owe everything to, first of all, my school, uh, the Institute of Foreign Languages in, in Moscow, and secondly, my five years uh, working at the UN. What was your first meeting and acquaintance with Mr. Gorbachev? Right after he became uh, General Secretary, April 1985, he was interviewed by a reporter from India because the visit of Rajiv Gandhi, the Indian Prime Minister, was being prepared, and so he granted uh, an interview to an Indian reporter, and I interpreted that, that interview. Within hours of the Chernenko funeral, uh, President Reagan proposed a summit with the new leader, with Mr. Gorbachev, at Geneva. When did you know you would be going to Geneva with him? Actually, uh, during the preparations for the Geneva summit, I was in New York working in the Soviet delegation, and uh, I was not at all prepared for the kind of uh, news that I received. It was totally a surprise. It came, I think, less than a week before the summit. There had been a more than a, a six-year hiatus, a gap, between um, the last meeting between the uh, Soviet and American leaders and this one in Geneva. What was the atmosphere like when President Reagan met Mr. Gorbachev? Well, the first meeting certainly was not marked by an atmosphere of trust and cooperation that developed a lot later. But I think they both made a good effort, even though they both regarded themselves as representing countries who are adversaries and even potential enemies. They both made a good effort. Before their meeting, President Reagan had been talking of the evil empire and using phrases like that. Presumably he didn't do that at, at the summit. Well, he certainly didn't use the phrase the evil empire at the summit. In some of his subsequent public speeches, he did use some similar phrases. But so far as I know, you know, as the relationship between Gorbachev and himself and the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States improved, uh, he really, in most cases, tried to avoid that kind of language. And, of course, during his visit to Moscow in May 1988, he was asked specifically by an American reporter whether he still considered the Soviet Union an evil empire. And he said, no. He said, I no longer consider it the evil empire because the country is uh, changing in the, in the direction that we welcome this happened during Mr. Reagan's tour of the Kremlin, and I was present there, and uh, I heard that uh, response to a, a very pointed question, and I think it, it really marked the evolution of the relationship. Were those one-on-one -on -one meetings very intense in terms of concentration from your point of view? Well, any meeting when you interpret at, at the highest levels of government, any summit meeting, work requires a lot of concentration and you, you do feel uh, you know more than kind of average responsibility. On the other hand, 
you know, any interpreter, when he or she, you know, do any kind of work, have to concentrate. You know, that, that this is a must, whether you interpret at the summit or you interpret at some conference on, on tax policy. Reagan kept quoting the Russian proverb, which meant trust but verify. Was that his only Russian phrase? Well, yes, he, he actually liked to quote that proverb, but he also quoted a number of others, and some of them, you know, many Russians did not even know. And those were good proverbs. I, I understand that uh, some people specifically did uh, research for him in order to find uh, the proverbs that would uh, sound good. That first meeting in Geneva was very much a sort of getting to know each other meeting. The meeting at Reykjavik in, in 1986 was a much more important meeting in terms of the discussions. How did you find that meeting? What kind of pressure did, what were you under for that? Well, I, I would disagree that the Geneva meeting was just a get-to-know-each-other meeting, just a, the, the first handshake kind of meeting. I believe that it was a very important meeting. You remember it was at that meeting that they included in the joint uh, statement the phrase that nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And, you know, before that, there was a lot of talk on the American side and probably some talk on the Soviet side, at, at least, you know, within government, that, well, uh, nuclear war is just uh, another kind of war. There are things more important than peace, etc., etc. And it was very important that the two leaders made that statement, and I believe that really the, the beginning of the process of nuclear disarmament can be traced back to the Geneva summit. But, of course, the Reykjavik summit was a very, very substantive discussions of the nuts and bolts of arms control, of the, of the bean counting, of the uh, missiles, submarines, strategic defense initiative. All of these things were, at that time, very important. I think they still are. And uh, that, of course, you know, plays on the interpreters uh, who worked on both sides a great burden of responsibility. When Gorbachev proposed a mutual elimination of all strategic offensive arms over that period of 10 years and said he was prepared to accept any form of verific verification, this surprised the Americans. Did it surprise you? No, it didn't surprise me. I, I, I of course, knew in advance of that meeting uh, that uh, Gorbachev will be making a, a rather dramatic proposal, and the first very dramatic proposal was... Uh, about cutting in half, about a 50% half of all types of nuclear weapons, both land-based, uh, sea-launched, and uh, bombers. And that was a very important proposal because he agreed that within that cut, the Soviet heavy missiles, which the Americans regarded as the most dangerous ones, uh, would also be cut in, in half. And that was the first time that uh, a Soviet leader agreed to that kind of cut in that particular category of weapons. And in the process, also, when President Reagan started to talk about his uh, fears of nuclear war and that the Strategic Defense Initiative is aimed at preventing nuclear war, Gorbachev did say that the best way to prevent nuclear war would be to eliminate all strategic nuclear weapons over a period of 10 years. Uh, it was quite dramatic, but it was quite consistent with uh, Gorbachev's uh, general policy and with his statement calling for the elimination of nuclear weapons within 10 years. And th that statement was made long before the Reykjavik summit on January 15, 1986. The fact that they went on to discuss this idea was, to me, of course, it was very welcome. I believe that it was a kind of psychological breakthrough that both leaders were thinking about this. Can you give me some idea of the, of the flavor of these meetings, which were clearly so very important? Well, the, the very first meeting in Reykjavik was just a one-on-one -on -one meeting between Gorbachev and Reagan, and there was an interpreter on each side and also a note-taker on each side, so there were six individuals in, in the room. Then after about half an hour, I forget whether it was Reagan or Gorbachev who said, let us invite uh, our foreign ministers, and therefore Shevardnadze and Schultz were invited. And the rest of the Reykjavik summit was two-on-two two rather than one-on-one. On one. And it was a, a rather small room, actually, and 
eight people in that one room, it was, I think, more than enough. You know, at some point got, you know, a little stuffy in the room because uh, of the presence of eight people in the room. Actually, Hefti House, in which uh, the Reykjavik summit was held, is, is a very small place, and it would have been a good place to hold a really small and informal summit that was initially envisioned. But in, in real life, whenever you know two leaders agree that the summit would be small, informal, without protocol, formalities, etc., etc., it never really works out that way, and there were dozens of officials present on both sides. But of course, in, in the room itself, there were just those eight individuals, and most of the talking was done by Reagan and Gorbachev, but particularly the presence of George Shultz was very important because President Reagan never really paid much attention to details. He, he was not a detail kind of political leader, and uh, Shultz uh, was very knowledgeable about those details. There were quite a number of observers of President Reagan who, who felt that he didn't have too much of a grasp of, of foreign affairs and that kind of, of detail. Was that Mr. Gorbachev's um, feeling either before or after they'd met? Well, I would say it's common knowledge that President Reagan did not have much interest in the details. You know, when he wanted to get into some detailed matter, he was quite able to understand. But the fact is that he was a kind of an instinctive, intuitive politician and statesman, and therefore for him, uh, more general things were important, and he could hold his ground on those things quite well. And I think Gorbachev understood that, and uh, to my knowledge, he really never tried to take advantage of Reagan's uh, style. Reagan was the elected leader of the United States. Gorbachev had a, a lot of really healthy respect for that from the start. He really understood uh, who he was dealing with. There was an outside perception at the time that President Reagan was initially inclined to accept uh, Mr. Gorbachev's proposals at Reykjavik and very nearly agreed and, and was then talked out of it by his own foreign minister and foreign staff. Was that your impression? Well, that really was not just an impression. I, I, I think that is the way it was. And, and the records uh, of the Reykjavik summit, which have been published, I think they confirmed that that was indeed the fact. Obviously, at that time, if Reagan even had accepted that proposal, uh, the, the Americans would have found a way to back out of that agreement. Uh, so I would say that, however, the fact that Reagan, the President of the United States, discussed in very serious terms the possibility of the elimination of the abolition of nuclear weapons was of great political and psychological importance. But was Gorbachev very disappointed when the Americans finally wouldn't agree? I think he was, yes, but, but his disappointment was, was not of a bitter kind. And if you recall, right after the Reykjavik summit, there was that famous press conference uh, where he spoke about the outcome of the Reykjavik summit, and he used the phrase that Reykjavik was not a failure, but rather a breakthrough. He really went beyond any initial disappointment in, in that comment. When they met in Washington in, in December 87, they did in fact reach the uh, first arms elimination agreement of the nuclear age in that INF treaty, but it was a much more modest aim than Mr. Gorbachev's original proposals at Reykjavik. Was it, however, do you think, important psychologically? Oh, absolutely, and, and he wanted to take that first step. He believed that eliminating at least two categories of nuclear weapons was a very important beginning on a road to the abolition of nuclear weapons, and that's why he agreed to taking that step, even though it, it fell short of, of his goals for the first phase of nuclear disarmament. He would have liked to add a 50% cut in strategic nuclear weapons. He wanted to regard that as a package, but when he saw that pragmatically, realistically, that was not possible, that, that the next step would, would have to be somewhat 
postponed. He agreed with that, and he agreed that the first step would be modest. But remember, this was, and still is, the the only agreement in in history that totally eliminates a certain class of nuclear weapons held by the uh, two great powers. Reagan had this very relaxed style, and Mr. Gorbachev's was a very forceful style. Did you and your American opposite number try and echo that in, in your interpretations? Well, normally my interpretation style is that you try to be a little more neutral than, than the speaker because the principal speaker has other ways of expressing whatever he wants to express, whether it is warmth or strength or cordiality or relaxed manner. The body language also works, and it is good to leave it to the principal to use the body language and to use all the other resources. So my interpretation style is always somewhat more neutral than what the speaker is saying. I believe that that's the right approach. Uh, so certainly the evolving relationship and the emerging warmth, the emerging human relationship is mostly expressed by the speaker, by the president or whatever the person is. I never uh, try to uh, act too much. Uh, I, I never try to pick it up all together. After all, I am an interpreter. I'm not someone who is playing the role of my principal in a different language. After that Washington meeting, former President Nixon made a famous remark. He said Gorbachev was born with a master's degree in public relations. I don't know whether he intended that as a compliment or not. I suspect he did. Well, frankly, I, I, I really don't think that Gorbachev was really a public relations man. To my knowledge, and, and I think that, you know, knowing him for more than 10 years now, he really has always cared more about the issues than about the way the issues are presented. It was probably the contrast between him and the Leonid Brezhnev uh, of his later years and other Soviet leaders that made Nixon make that kind of statement, that kind of characterization. The real, you know, breakthrough and the real difference that Gorbachev made was that he understood that in international relations, in the relations between the countries like the Soviet Union and the United States, public relations alone, and frankly, propaganda alone, cannot change the relationship in a way that he wanted to change it. He really cared more about the issues than about grandstanding, public relations, or propaganda. Obviously, the personal relations between the leaders do matter because the clear rapport between Reagan and Gorbachev that one saw on the newsreels didn't seem, certainly to begin with, to have the same warmth with when President Bush succeeded him. Why do you think that was? Well, I, I really wouldn't say so. The first meeting between Gorbachev and Bush in Malta in December 1989, that, that was less than a year after uh, Bush became president. Obviously that warmth did begin to come um, in Malta, because I think Shevardnadze wrote later that in Malta the Cold War quietly came to an end. Did it feel that way at the time? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I believe that Yes, psychologically, the Cold War ended in Malta, and uh, a lot of preparatory work was done by Reagan and Schultz and Gorbachev and Shevardnadze during the Reagan years, but it, it was really in Malta that uh, the end of the Cold War became, in my opinion, quite final. Both uh, Gorbachev and, and Bush are pragmatic, no-nonsense politicians and statesmen, and when Gorbachev saw that the ideas and the proposals and uh, the positions that Bush brought to Malta uh, really indicated a desire on the American side to move toward a partnership with uh, the Soviet Union, to move from confrontation to real cooperation, he appreciated that, and he tried to begin that interaction on the Soviet side. So um, the warmth, maybe the, there, there wasn't much warmth in, in, in Malta, but the, the relationship picked up speed, picked up a lot of momentum 
in Malta and after Malta. It wasn't long after Malta that the attempted coup happened. Where were you when that happened and were you surprised? Yes, of course I was surprised. I was uh, on, on vacation. Uh, on that particular day I was in uh, Moscow and uh, I was supposed to m report back to work on August the 20th, which was the day when the Union Treaty, the Union Treaty into which uh, Gorbachev had really invested so much effort and which was supposed to be signed on that day between uh, Gorbachev, Yeltsin and the leaders of other republics. Uh, the Union Treaty was supposed to be signed and I was supposed to report back to work on that day. So instead, on uh, uh, August the 19th, we learned uh, about that uh, coup and I just, like everybody, I think I was quite surprised. I mean, it looked from the outside as, as if... Obviously, it was a great shock to Mr. Gorbachev's self-confidence, and he never seemed quite the same man again. Was that your impression? No, no. I, I, I think it was a, a shock to him, but he continued to make his best efforts, and I saw him very determined. I, I saw him very often because at that time I, I was already working on, on his staff in, in the office of the president of the USSR and uh, I saw him quite often during those uh, days and weeks and I remember him very very determined and quite strong not at all a, a shaken man you were at his side for most of the most important international meetings that he had throughout that very important period which changed the face of, of the whole of Europe and the whole of the world in many ways how did you feel he himself changed o over those years? Well, he's a person who has, I think, this, this one, of, one of his qualities is that he's a person who changes. He's a person whose views evolve. And certainly he came to power as someone who believed in, in, in the old system, whatever you call that system, communist or socialist or Soviet system and uh, at that time he definitely believed that some kind of uh, partial reform, some kind of facelift uh, could, could change the system for the better, could make the system work. He also believed that most of the positions taken by the Soviet Union internationally were just and right and appropriate and it was uh, rather gradually but inexorably and always I think step by step that those views changed and in 1988 for example he proposed that relatively free and contested elections be held for the first time in the history of the Soviet Union obviously a person had to undergo a tremendous evolution to propose that given that as I say he came to power with a belief in the Soviet system uh, also, internationally, he was quite willing to uh, listen to the views of others, and uh, when he saw that any particular Soviet position or policy was incorrect, inappropriate, or, or needed a dramatic change, he was willing to accept that. Look at the I INF missiles, for example. When he came to believe that, that the very existence of, of INF missiles was dangerous for the world and, and for the Soviet Union, he was able to change that. So I would say that you know, he is a man who can change. His ideology changed. He developed within himself and in the country the acceptance of the democratic process. And, and that, of course, is, uh, I still believe, his greatest achievement, probably as important as working to end the Cold War. He went through that very difficult situation for a world statesman of, as his reputation, his popularity grew abroad, it seemed to fall at home. And now he seems not to be very popular at all, as was shown in the recent presidential elections. But do you think that his reputation at home will change over time? Well, perhaps. You, you, you never know. You know, Russia is a, a difficult country. It has a history of not appreciating leaders who work uh, toward at least relative freedom and democracy. Russia doesn't seem yet to appreciate the role, for example, of Tsar Alexander II or of Mr. Khrushchev. So I don't know. I, I hope that 
the Russian people will appreciate Gorbachev as, as much as the world appreciates him, but I, I don't know. Did you never despair? Yes, there were moments of great disappointment and even despair. I still think that you know, the, the republics of the former Soviet Union should have found a way of, of working together, and this did not happen, and as a result, we see many dramatic and even tragic things. There, there should have been a better way, and there was a better way. It didn't happen, and that's very disappointing to me. On the other hand, I see that very bumpily and, and with, with uh, a lot of uh, problems. Uh, the democratic process continues in, in most of those republics. That is a, a source of hope. So, you know, it's life. Uh, the, 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 there are good days and bad days. There are good periods in history and bad periods in history, and, and some that are, like, in between. That, that's life. Did you feel at the time that you were standing at the shoulder of a man who was making history, and do you think that's even more important now? Well, I, I, I believe that what was done in Gorbachev's time by Gorbachev and other leaders to end the Cold War was uh, tremendously important. I believe that that kind of transition from total nuclear confrontation to cooperation and interaction between the world's biggest uh, countries, biggest powers, was done with, uh, I think, miraculous smoothness. And the Cold War ended in a kind of whimper. It ended also, I think, on, on very fair terms. So I, I very much believe in what was done at that time. And I really think that it was my great luck to participate in the process.